Good morning and welcome to CSIS. I'm Johanna Nesseth. I'm Senior Vice President here and I co-direct our project on U.S. Leadership and Development. I want to welcome you all today. We have um, a great session today that's going to dive into the link between infrastructure, trade, and development. We've had underway for three years a very focused look at the role of the private sector in development uh, writ large, but what we keep coming back to is the importance of trade, investment, uh, job creation, small, medium-sized enterprise creation, and foreign direct investment in long-term economic growth. So really delighted to be able to talk about a new publication out by Dr. Moreira from um, the IDB, who is uh, put together a great deal of data and explanation about what the importance is and uh, some of the detailed numbers of why. I'd like to ask Dr. Antoni Esteva de Ordal, if I said that correctly, to come and make a few opening remarks and welcome you all and talk through a little bit about why IDB has looked at this issue and what its relevance is in terms of the uh, both public sector debate and as well as the private sector debate. So thank you for being here and I'll turn it over. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Johanna. Uh, I want to thank first the CSIS to partner with us uh, for this uh, event. Thanks to Scott and also all his staff for all his uh, for all their help in putting together this uh, this event. Let me just give you a very few uh, few remarks before in, uh, introducing Mauritius and his presentation. Uh, first remark is about a reminder for all, uh, for all of us who follow uh, Latin America that despite the performance, the great performance that we had, at least in the last 10 years in this region, in the Latin American and the Caribbean, uh, we have to remind ourselves that this region is still a region that uh, is well behind uh, the levels of uh, global uh, integration uh, compared to other regions. This is a region that today, in terms of trade, still weights less than 10% of global trade, around 8%. This is a percentage that hasn't changed much in the last 25, 30 years. Uh, so this is still a big gap to fill in terms of our global engagement uh, with, uh, with the global markets. Uh, Asia, or East Asia, was uh, their participation in global trade in the 60s and the 70s was lower than Latin America. Today is 25, 30 percent of global trade. It's a huge catch up in terms of their insertion into the global markets. So lots of things still for our region to catch up in terms of uh, global integration. But there's another gap. There's a gap in, uh, in our own regional uh, uh, integration. Uh, the levels of intra-regional trade, the trade that we do among each other uh, in our region, is around 20%, depending on how you group the countries. But this is still much, much uh, uh, lower than the levels in Asia, around 40% or Europe, 60% of the trade among neighbors. So huge gap in terms of global uh, integration, huge gap is still in terms of uh, regional uh, uh, integration. The question is how we can try to fill up these gaps. Uh, of course, there are policies, and the bank, of course, is working on this, like other development partners, uh, long-term policies that have to do uh, with uh, policies, uh, structural reforms that will create a better uh, competitive environment for our economies. This means investments in education in the long term, investments in innovation. These are long-term uh, investments that we will have to do if, if we want to become competitive into the global economy and competitive with respect to other partners. But there are things that can be done at the short, at the medium term. And this has to do with trying to remove trade costs, trade barriers, to dismantle some of the barriers that today impede trade to move freely among uh, countries and among our region and the rest of the, of the world. And this type of uh, interventions, uh, we at the bank try to look at in, in, two, uh, in two different types of interventions. One, what we call the soft type of interventions, things that have to do with improving the regulatory framework for trade and investment. Those are policies to, uh, uh, to facilitate trade trade logistics, customs procedures, trade agreements, removing non-tariff barriers, standards, and so on. 
the, the region has done a lot of progress here, uh, has done a lot of progress in terms, especially on the traditional removal of tariffs. We have been probably one of the regions that have been able to remove faster uh, tariffs from 40% uh, 15, 20 years ago to less than 10% today. So this is a relatively good job that we have to do, we have done, but there's still a lot of things uh, that uh, remain as part of these uh, uh, barriers. And the other set of interventions have to do with physical uh, infrastructure, physical connectivity, huge gap in our region in terms of connecting better uh, our countries in the region and our region with respect to, with the rest of the, of the world. And this is part of what this book uh, uh, does. Last point on these uh, diagnostics, uh, these two policies, the soft side and the hard side, those are complementary policies, and this is very important. We cannot do one without the other. We can have the best infrastructure between two countries, the best roads, but if the customs doesn't function properly, it doesn't matter. Or the reverse, we could have excellent customs uh, facilities, excellent customs procedures, but if we don't have the roads that connect the two countries, uh, nothing is going to happen. So these are really uh, complementary interventions that have to be done. Actually, we have estimated at the bank that the trade potential that the region has in the next few years, if we actually work in these two types of interventions, 20% of, or more, 40% of the gains, 30 to 40% of the gains will come from these interventions at the soft, at the regulatory level. 60% will come from doing this uh, type of investments at the physical, at the physical level. Uh, final remark, something about the, uh, our work at the bank, uh, and I'm glad here that I have some colleagues from the infrastructure department. Uh, this, uh, this agenda for the bank is, uh, is, uh, is one of the key priorities. We had the capital increase a couple of years ago. The bank committed through this capital increase uh, having 15% of our lending uh, to invest in those type of projects. So by 2015, around $1.8 billion of bank resources will be devoted to this type of uh, uh, projects. And we are working uh, uh, on that, uh, especially with infrastructure uh, colleagues at the, uh, at the bank. And complementing this operational work, we have a very active research agenda, which is part of what we want to share with you today. Uh, a research agenda that we have been uh, working for the last four or five years. The report that you will see today is a part of a series of reports. We have been looking at uh, uh, how the region has to work on removing this uh, type of trade cost. We start looking at international trade cost in a report that we did three years ago. We focus after uh, on a report that look at the, at the network of trade agreements, how to uh, uh, better enhance the functioning of this network of FTAs that we have, especially focusing on issues like rules of origin. Uh, we had to work, we had a, a report on the information cost, how we can access better new markets, how we can introduce new products in new markets. This was a work uh, which actually the author is here in the audience, uh, to try to evaluate the policies on export promotion of our, uh, of our agencies in the region. And the book that you will be uh, hearing about today, the, that we're releasing uh, today, is about the cost at the intra, the international, intra uh, domestic cost, the, uh, the cost that takes place between the, the goods that comes from, uh, from uh, the, the way the, where they are produced to the, uh, to the place that they are uh, distributed in the, uh, in the country. Uh, so with this, I'm going to introduce uh, Mauricio, which is our sector economic advisor. He's the coordinator of our research program at the bank. Uh, and with further ado, I'll pass the word to uh, Mauricio for his presentation to follow up by the panel uh, shared by Scott. Thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> thank you all for coming. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, CSIS for hosting this event, Scott, Joanna. Uh, you know, it, it's uh, clearly a great opportunity for us to be sharing, you know, the, the findings of our most recent work. Uh, as you can see, I mean, the, the title is very much self-explanatory. We were trying to look into the impact of the domestic transport costs on, uh, on the region exports, uh, not only in the volume, of, but how uh, you know, exports are distributed uh, along those countries. It wasn't you know, a, a single uh, uh, venture. I mean, it was a joint work. I mean, uh, uh, both Juan Blind, uh, Christian Vope, and Daniel 
Ken Molina, uh, you know, was, uh, they were key partners of this, of this work. And uh, I, I would like to begin by uh, explaining why we did this. I mean, just in case you guys are wondering why uh, you know, trade economists will be putting so much focus on uh, infrastructure issues. And, and, and I'll give you at least two, uh, uh, um, how do I move that? No, not this one. How do I move this thing? The, the, uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Is there a pointer here? Or, uh, okay. So the first uh, motivation has to do with this big shift in the, uh, in the relative uh, trade costs. I mean, uh, by trade costs, we mean all the, the costs that are incurred by uh, firms uh, when they engage in international trade. So it, was, it is very clear to us that uh, you know, uh, we can't keep doing trade policy the way we did in the, the 80s and the 90s. I mean, we, we are in a totally different world. And why? Because you know, we were very successful in, being, in bringing the, the traditional trade costs down. I mean, we went through very successful liberalizations across the region. I mean, we, we sign a lot of trade agreements. Of course, there are still a few holdouts. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll include my country, Brazil, for instance, among those uh, that, you know, there's still, that have still a lot of job to do in terms of bringing those costs down. But the fact of the matter that we don't have that situation where you know, tariffs were 80% or prohibit, and, and, and they were clearly the elephant in the room. So tariffs were clearly uh, went down and at the same time, we had this huge increase in the importance of transport costs for a number of reasons. First of all, because of this, you know, I would say, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, secular underinvestment in, in infrastructure. Of course, you know, we did, uh, 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 we made some progress, but clearly not enough to, to address all, all our needs. So uh, uh, clearly, we have been underinvesting. The debt crisis of the 80s made that thing even worse. And, and, and you know, it's just uh, and when you had the, the commodity booms in, in, in the in the 90, in the 2000s, you know, the, 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 the bottlenecks became even more uh, clear. We also had this huge increase in the fragmentation of world production. You know, the, the fact that you were you know uh, spreading uh, uh, the production of goods across the globe, which put a very high premium on uh, on, on having a good uh, logistics. Uh, which is, you know, if you want to really participate in the global value chains, you need to have good ports, uh, good airports, good roads, and so, and so on and so forth. And finally, you have this uh, uh, Asian uh, emergency. I mean, the fact that China came along in, in, in the 2000s, not only China, but India and all the, the big Asian countries. And this has put a lot of pressure in the region to specialize in what we call transport intensive goods, which are not only commodities, you know, the freight is a huge part of the the final price, uh, which makes transport costs even more important to us, but not just commodities. I mean, we can think also of you know, uh, uh, transport-intensive manufacturing goods. Uh, a good example is the, the, the case of Mexico. You know, the fact that Mexico is recovering some market share in the U.S. market has to do with those type of goods that are very heavy when it costs a lot to transport, you know, those, this huge TV plasma, cars, and things like that. So there's no doubt that, you know, where tariffs and traditional costs went down, transport costs had a huge increase in terms of relevance for the region. And we made a, a first attempt to address this issue in this work we published uh, a couple of years ago, where we showed, we, we, we focused on international freights. Now we wanted to show that, you know, if you look at international freights uh, and you, you, you calculate those freights as a share of the, the final price of the exports, they're, they are much higher uh, than any tariffs that those uh, countries could face. This is the case of the U.S. You know, the blue uh, uh, bars are the, the freight costs at valoring compared to the tariffs. You, know, it, you can go anywhere in the country, and it's not just the U.S. market. If you go to the Latin American market, you see the same uh, uh, kind of, uh, of, uh, of issue. And it's, you know, the, the money, uh, so to speak, it's on bringing uh, uh, those costs down and not uh, uh, exactly on, on bringing uh, uh, tariffs down. That was the main, uh, the first. But one thing about this work is that we left a lot of uh, uh, things out of the equation, 
And we, in particularly, we didn't cover the, the internal cost, you know, the cost factory to the port, which I think it's a huge part of the problem. So we wanted to cover this gap uh, in this uh, uh, second word. Another uh, important motivation that came well, uh, exactly at the time when we start to look behind the border, uh, we were in the first work we were looking beyond border. When we start looking be behind the border, it was clear to us that uh, the, the, the high transport cost that the region faced has a lot to do with this very uneven uh, trade gains that you see across the region. I mean, exports are very much concentrated in, in, a, in a few countries, I mean, in a few cities, in a few municipalities. And uh, our hunch was that this has a lot to do with the fact that the, the, the infrastructure is very much concentrated in the, in the coastal areas, you know, in, in the main cities. You're talking about Sao Paulo, you talk about Lima, Bogota, so on and so forth. So if we wanted to show that, uh, you know, if you can improve, reduce those costs, perhaps you can spread those gains and, and improve the political economy of, of trade in the region as well. So, uh, with these uh, uh, motivations in mind, we, 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 we set out to you know, uh, do this work, which the objectives are, are very simple and clear. You know, we wanted to provide a more detailed description on how exports are distributed ac across the, the countries in the region to show how concentrated that they are. And I, I'll, I'll talk a little bit later on. Uh, it, it sounds very simple, but in, in practice, it's very complicated. Then we wanted to estimate how much it costs to ship those goods from municipalities to the ports, to the, the customs of exit. And finally, we want to uh, assess the impact of those costs in, in both the volume and the diversification of export. The, the idea is here is to give policymakers a, 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 a sense of how much the country would gain if they really uh, address uh, those uh, infrastructure issues. So, uh, <clears throat> to, do, I mean, to, to achieve those ob objectives, we had to uh, uh, face a, a number of challenges, uh, which in hindsight uh, it, it is clearly uh, it seem insane, but uh, I'm glad in the end we did it, which was first to, to build the data, because you know, there wasn't data available. I think that was part of uh, uh, no, the, the, the contribution we make is, it clearly, there isn't hard data about infrastructure uh, in the region. So we need to build this data, uh, first identifying where the exports came from, uh, which is not so simple because uh, firms usually report the export from their headquarters. So if you really wanted to, to know where they come from, you need to do a lot of uh, you know, data mining to make sure you get the right origin uh, of those exports. A good example, of that is the CVRD, this mining company in Brazil, that you know, uh, report all the iron ore exports from Rio de Janeiro, even, re even though Rio de Janeiro doesn't have any uh, uh, iron ore exports. Second, we need to know where, I mean, how much it would cost to, to ship those goods from those oranges to the ports. Another huge task, since there's no uh, transport surveys of freights in the region, we end up uh, you know, falling a, a methodology which uh, take advantage of a few uh, transport services surveys in the region. With those services, we managed to build, uh, uh, you know, the, the costs, the operational costs of trucks, you know, of shipping goods, uh, including both distance and time costs. You know, the usual few uh, tires, uh, you know, the maintenance, wages, and so on and so forth. So we use the, these two uh, data, you know, the origin, the transport costs, and uh, you know, uh, uh, to identify uh, uh, the routes, you know, we had the information where the, the, the exports were coming from and, and which port they were leaving. This is the case, for instance, for Brazil, you know, leaving Rodonópolis, exports of soy. Huh? Leaving Rodonópolis, going through road to, uh, uh, to Mato Grosso and then by rail to, to the port of Santos. So we had this, this uh, route identified with the data of the transport survey. We, could calculate the operational costs of trucks along those routes. Uh, and, and then we finally calculate uh, uh, the, the, the ad valorem transport costs. I mean, we just divided 
you know, the shipping costs uh, along the whole route by the, the value of exports because we wanted to have you know, a, a differentiation across routes. I mean, if we're just looking at the, 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 the value, uh, the, the cost per ton along the route, we wouldn't know how much it, it, it impacts different goods. I mean, transporting soy is not the same thing as transporting you know, cars or ships or so on and so forth. So with that volume, we had a better view of how much uh, the, the importance of transport cost varies across good. So the overall database is Chile, Colombia, Peru, Brazil, and Mexico. This was mainly because you know, uh, we couldn't find data, enough data elsewhere in the region to do this kind of exercise. But clearly, this is 80% of, of, of the region exports. So we, I think we got a, a, a good representative sample. So just to uh, give you uh, uh, some of the main uh, descriptive results, I mean, the, this is our, you know, the, 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 the median and the variance of the cost, the, the shipping cost to exports across those countries. You know, this, this is the, the median, uh, this, uh, this line across the box. As you can see, it's pretty low. It's 2%, uh, even lower than 2% in Peru. And you might be thinking, why? But if it's that too low, why these guys you know, are worrying about that? I mean, there's no problem there. But the fact that it's too low, it's not a good thing. I mean, it just reflects the fact that since the infrastructure is so concentrated you know, in Sao Paulo, in Bogota, I mean, and it's so lousy elsewhere in those countries, the, the firms end up clustering around those cities, and you end up missing all the opportunities that could be elsewhere in the country. So it's not a, you know, instead of signaling a good sign, it's a bad sign. So uh, we use the data, this data also to look at the distribution of exports across the country. This is sort of a 3D map. I'm sorry you guys don't have the, you know, those glasses here. But, uh, 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 but uh, it's, it's, the idea is to, to look at the correlation between transport costs and the distribution of exports uh, in a way that you don't have to put that classic uh, graph. Uh, uh, and, and I think it's more, uh, uh, Ill illustrative when you see it that way. So in the case of Brazil, you see this huge bump around Sao Paulo, around the south, southeast, uh, with more than 25% of, of all exports. And you see this lighter color uh, in the rest of the country. So this huge concentration in the southeast. And in, in the other map, you have you know, the, the ad valor in transport costs to export. And as you can see, there's this this uh, asymmetry between the two. The areas that export more are those, the areas that have the lower transport cost to export. And you see the same story when you go around the, 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 the region, you know, you look at the other countries. This is Peru, you know, the, the area in, in Lima, you know, which concentrate most of the exports. When you go to the Sierra or the Selva, you don't see much of exports going on. And, and, and you look at those the, the ad valori, the transport cost to exports, now it's clearly a mirror. You know, so you have the, the Selva and the Sierra with the higher transport cost. So there's a, a clear correlation, a, a inverse correlation between the two. This is Mexico. Now, as you probably know, this huge concentration, this huge peak in Mexico City and along the border and, and the south. You know, you can even say that, uh, you know, Chiapas don't, don't even know what uh, uh, you know, NAFTA is because, you know, they, they, they practically don't, don't export at all. And, and, and the same thing if you look at, uh, you know, how transport costs, you know, uh, uh, measure across the regions. The South has one of the highest transport costs in the region. Colombia, the story is about Medellin, Bogota. No? And it was just, uh, you know, just 25% of the, the municipalities or districts exports, which is just 11% of the territory, uh, which is, you know, a, a huge concentration. And then in the same story, when you look at, you know, how the, the transport costs are uh, distributed across the country. Chile is the story about, you know, Santiago and the copper in the north, you know, and, and you have, you know, the south with little exports to, tell, to, tell, to talk about. In, in, a, in a huge uh, uh, transport cost to export. So please don't run away. I just want uh, <laughs> to, to explain uh, how exactly we got to those uh, uh, numbers. It's, it's a pretty simple uh, uh, framework. We're just trying to, to understand, you know, this exports from uh, municipality I to the port J of product P at time T. Anyone want to know how those exports are affected by Transport costs. So 
our you know variable meters uh, uh, coefficient of interest is the this, this one which gives us you know the, the payoff of a, a reduction in, in, in transport costs so these are the results uh, and as I mean uh, we can uh, Colombia clearly you know this, these are basically elasticities or, or in other words if you reduce transport costs by uh, if you increase transport costs by one percent uh, you reduce, in the case of Colombia, exports by 80%. You can read this the other way around. I mean, if you reduce transport costs by 1%, you increase uh, uh, agriculture uh, by 8%, manufacturing by a little less than 8%. And Colombia is huge. Uh, the other countries, too, uh, I mean, uh, they, they are, these are pretty impressive numbers. Of course, these are, you know, a first uh, approximation of what the impact could be. We could spend the whole... Uh, uh, Morning here discussing, you know, the the the, the technical technicalities behind uh, those numbers. We did a lot of robust uh, robustness tests, but it clearly showed there's a lot to gain just by you know addressing some of the issues. And these are just average across municipalities. There are you know municipalities that tend to 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 gain uh, much more, uh, uh, and this was going to be clear uh, in, in those simulations. So. With those results, we wanted to bring those results and those regressions closer to the realities of policymakers. I mean, if you come to them with a regression, I don't think we would have some, so much of impact. So we wanted to use those results and apply those results to the to real uh, world projects. So we, we went to, uh, uh, to Brazil, for instance, and got all the projects that are in the portfolio of the National Logistic Plan. And then we tried to simulate what would be the impact on exports if those projects were uh, executed. Uh, and w w particularly, what would be the, the, the regional impact of those exports? Those projects are the, the, the consensual uh, projects uh, in, in Brazil, you know, basically the, the, the railways uh, across the country and some of the, the waterways. Uh, I give you a, a sense of the, what would be the impact. So on the, the, the left-hand side is the impact on, on the volume of exports. As you can see, I mean, most of the impact is exactly on the areas where, in the areas where the, the exports is pretty low. Uh, you, you see impacts between 20 to 100%. Right? Nothing much going on in Sao Paulo in the southeast. And, and the, the right-hand side is the impact of the number of products those municipalities export. The idea that you know, lower transport costs can improve diversification as well. And again, you know, the, 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 the most important impacts are exactly in the, in the, the center west, in the northeast, and the north of the country, which are the areas, which are the, not only the area that export less, but also the poor, the, the more poor areas of the country. There are, I'm not going to show all the countries. I'm going to just give you uh, uh, two examples. This is the example of Peru. We did this, a similar thing with Peru. We get all the roads that are being uh, they are projected uh, uh, by the Peruvian government. Mainly, uh, you know, the most important are the inter, inter oceanic highways in the, 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 the north and the, the middle of the country, and, and, and in the south. And we wanted to see the impacts uh, across the country. And, and, and it's pretty clear that uh, you know, again, the ones that uh, benefit the most, or you can put it in, a, in, a, in another way. It shows pretty clear that the, the ones that lose the most with the, sh the, the state of the shape of the infrastructure in the region are clearly the poorer areas that have stuff to support. Now, they clearly have opportunities. There are natural resources in the Selva, you know, in the Sierra. Uh, but because of the infrastructure is so bad, they end up exporting very little. So the impact both on uh, the volume of exports and the number of, of product exported are clearly on those municipalities that are among the poorest uh, and more isolated in, in the country. So just to conclude, I mean, I think it's, uh, uh, it's pretty obvious uh, with those results that uh, you know, trade policy has to go uh, beyond the traditional tariff and non-tariff barriers. We, you know, governments uh, stand to gain a lot if they bring the, the issues of, of transport costs, of logistics into the, the, the equation. 
uh, uh, it's important to realize that what is at stake is not just how much the whole country is going to export, but also how those export gains are distributed across the country. We want to bring though, those uh, chapas that uh, so far haven't benefited <laughs> yet from the trade boom. And, and a good way of doing that is clearly bringing uh, transport costs down. So, uh, and, and then just to conclude, I mean, it's, it's this, this sort of a, you know, puzzle uh, that, uh, you know, it, it's pretty clear. And a lot of people say to me, well, what you guys are doing is pretty obvious. We all know that, uh, you know, uh, the, the infrastructure in the region is bad, that we need to do something about it. But why don't we do something about it? Uh, I mean, I think by putting figures, hard figures on those uh, uh, issues, I think we help to make this thing, this obvious, more, you know, uh, uh, intolerable. But we also, we also wanted to know why, you know, uh, why we move, don't move faster to address those issues. And here, just a couple of thoughts about that. I think uh, 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 budget constraint is, is clearly an issue. I mean, there's not enough resources for, uh, uh, for all the projects that we need. But that's, I think, particularly lately, is not the whole story. You know, the, the fiscal situation in the region has improved a lot in the last decade. But still, I think the governments haven't been doing uh, 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 making the right choices and not giving enough priorities to this kind of, uh, uh, of projects. Uh, uh, I, I, in Brazil, for instance, I think it's one clear example, has spending a lot of money in, in industrial policy issues, subsidizing manufacturing, whereas you could use those money, this money to, to fund and finance a lot of those very high return uh, 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 projects. Uh, and so there's, a, there's an issue of, of of public spending priority, but also there's a, a huge issue in terms of the, the weakness of the institutional framework in the region. I mean, uh, if you look at the transport cost, the transport, I'm mean, sorry, the, the, the transport ministries in the region, the people that work there, I mean, they uh, really, uh, they are not uh, prepared enough to either plan or to execute those projects. So it, it really impairs the ability of the government, of the state, to execute, even if they have a good diagnostic, they just can't execute. You just have to look at, you know, some of the logistic plans that Mexico and Brazil have, you know, uh, that, you know, they, 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 they're supposed, for instance, uh, Brazil uh, was supposed to finish uh, the, 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 the first logistic phase of all logistic projects uh, by now, 2013, and just managed to uh, uh, conclude 50% of the projects. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that they don't have the people to execute, uh, to plan and execute those projects. And this also affects the ability of bringing in the private sector. Because if you don't have good people in, in the government, uh, if you don't get uh, uh, skilled uh, civil servants, you can design a good regulatory framework and, and you can give the private sector a good uh, business environment to uh, uh, attract them to, to invest in infrastructure. So uh, I, I have no doubt that, that, that we, we won't be able to address these obvious issues uh, if we don't find a way of keeping, attracting, and, and training uh, uh, people uh, in, in the state, in the Ministry of Transportation in this country. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mauricio. Uh, let me add my compliments to the very uh, fascinating, high-quality uh, study. Um, and thank you to the audience. It was wonderful to see that equation hit the uh, PowerPoint slide, and uh, you didn't head for the exit. So th thanks for staying with us. Um, my name is uh, Scott Miller. I'm the uh, Shoal Chair in International Business here at CSIS. And let me add my welcome to CSIS for this morning's event. Uh, Mauricio will take your questions after we have a, a couple of expert commenters talk about the research that he's presented here. And 
I'm delighted to welcome to CSIS two genuine experts in Latin American development and uh, trade and investment. Barbara Kotswar is a research fellow for the C Peterson Institute for International Economics. She's been with the Peterson Institute uh, since 2007 and is a uh, respected voice on Latin America trade, investment, and regional economics. Prior to the Peterson Institute, Barbara was Chief of Foreign Trade Information System at the Organization for American States, and she's been a longtime advisor to Latin American and Caribbean governments. After Barbara makes some few comments, we'll hear from Ambassador David Nelson. Uh, David is Senior Manager, Global Government Affairs and Policy for the Americas for the General Electric Company. Uh, David came to General Electric in 2011 works in the region, and but he came from the region uh, in a way. He was had a career with the State Department, uh, including his uh, ter terminal job at the State Department was uh, the ambassador to Uruguay. But he spent a long time in the region and is an expert. Dave's, Dave has expertise in the Latin American region, but also General Electric is a very important infrastructure company, including building uh, locomotive engines as tra transport infrastructure. So we look forward to hearing from both panelists. Let me turn to Barbara first for her comments. Well, thank you so much, Scott, and thanks to you and to CSIS for allowing me to be part of this unveiling of this new study by the IDB. Um, I want to congratulate the authors of this study and of the set of studies that the IDB has done on this important public good and regional public good. Um, before talking about the substance, I want to mention something that sometimes gets overlooked, and that's the readability. Um, both this and the previous study on unclogging the arteries are surprisingly readable, and I've done quite a bit of reading on trade-related transport infrastructure, and most of it is very interesting and tells you some important stuff. And this one actually keeps you turning the pages. So they tell this as though it's a story and make you really want to know what's going to happen. And so I'm looking forward to the next story where you tell us, you know, what to do about all of this. Um, but, you know, it's, I, I actually, I really look forward to these studies, maybe as much as the next John Grisham not novel. So I, I really want to congratulate um, Tony and his team for writing important substantive work that is accessible to a wider audience, and I really hope that policymakers take note. Um, so this report, which addresses some of, actually some of the key policy issues confronting Latin America in addition to transportation infrastructure, um, is a very timely work as Latin American governments are implementing transportation projects um, and are confronting a number of other issues. The report builds upon the bank's earlier seminal infrastructure publication, Unclogging the Arteries, which I think has one of the best titles ever um, for an academic work. And it shows us, which showed us clearly how important the issue of transportation infrastructure was. That book emph emphasized the infrastructure gap in Latin America, both in terms of hard and soft infrastructure, um, which is really important for a region that hasn't quite reached its full growth potential. So in that book, it emphasized the differential in infrastructure quality in Latin America versus other regions. Um, we know that, that there's, it's been estimated that differences in the quality of infrastructure account for about a quarter of the growth differential between Latin America and Asia. And so this is a compelling policy issue. Um, it also helps to explain some of the region's competitiveness challenges. So why it costs about more than three and a half times more to export a 20-foot container from Colombia and Brazil than it does from Indonesia or Korea. And I think this is another compelling issue for firms and policymakers in the region. So this report um, takes up some of the most important issues raised by unclogging the arteries and leads us into even more important policy issues. It delves into the depths of some of the core issues of concern for Latin American policymakers and society. Um, this book uses an immense database, and I'm not even sure how these guys <laughs> managed to get, I mean, the, the heat maps that you see there and the numbers that they associate with are the result of what I can only imagine are, you know, years of work, and you somehow condense that, I think, into months of work. So. Um, that's a really big contribution to the literature and to, to policymakers' tools. Um, 
what they've done is looked at the infrastructure gap and seen how delving within countries, this adds to another pressing issue, which is income inequality and the, the in unequal distribution of opportunities among individuals and firms in Latin America. And I think that uncovering this is a, a remarkable contribution. Um, Latin American countries still suffer from being among the most unequal in the world, despite a decade of significant improvement. And so this is something that needs to be looked at seriously. Um, again, looking to the East for comparison, we find that the average income genie in Latin America is on average eight points higher than Asia, which as Tony mentioned, um, and as has been documented well, has more robust and more equitable distribution of infrastructure, and I think that's an important point. Um, it's well known that income inequality is a drag on growth, so this study has some very serious policy implications. Um, and this makes the vehicles driving at least some of that inequality, which is uncovered in this study, even more compelling. Um, I think the study shows unambiguously how income inequality is driven by the current distribution of infrastructure. And by uncovering this, the report offers policymakers some concrete measures that they could take to uncover, to, to address this. Admittedly, addressing infrastructure challenges is difficult and not always a popular policy challenges, um, but it can help countries who in the past decade have helped move millions of poor people into the middle class and who are now facing the challenge of helping these people maintain their position and gain a more consolidated footing on the socioeconomic ladder. Um, Mauricio's study shows how improving infrastructure could help countries achieve these gains, and they give some very concrete numbers of doing that. Now, moving back to trade, um, the results can also serve as a starting point for identifying how to allow more individuals and firms to be able to take advantage of the gains from trade, and for countries to more fully utilize the possibilities that the trade policy liberalization measures that they've implemented over the last decade and a half could actually, been act could actually be actualized. Um, they haven't really been able to fully exploit these measures because so many people have been cut off from the ability to participate in this. So as Tony mentioned, Latin American and Caribbean areas, trade participation gaps persists, both internationally and in terms of regional integration. Um, this also has a bearing on, on firm participation. According to the World Bank's most recent enterprise surveys, nearly a quarter of Latin American firms identify transportation infrastructure as a constraint to doing business. Um, this is even more so in some cases for the small countries, and it would probably, for the small countries, for the small and medium firms, and it would probably be even higher if so many of those firms were not cut off from being able to export um, completely by this inadequate um, transportation infrastructure. Um, to compare it to East Asia, only 15% of firms identified transportation infrastructure as one of their main um, constraints. So too far to export gives concrete examples of how the distribution of this public good is preventing firms from accessing markets um, and gives concrete and compelling estimates of the additional gains that could be accrued by rectifying this. And so Mauricio pointed out that maybe some of these conclusions seem obvious and we know that Latin America has poor infrastructure, um, but I really hope that some of the deeper policy issues that they have uncovered by doing this wonderful work will be taken to heart by policymakers, and that some of these illustrations prompt people to push for their governments to act in a way, um, in a quick and, and proper way in order to help address these issues. So um, I think in summary, we look forward to hearing a lot about this. I hope that people promote this, um, and I think that my colleague Ambassador Nelson will have some more concrete results from the private sector perspective on this. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. David? Um, thanks, Scott. Uh, I'd like to congratulate you, first of all, Scott, you and, and CSIS for putting on this program, which is an extremely important topic. I mean, this is really fundamental to economic growth in the region. I'd like to 
um, congratulate Barbara and the Peterson Institute for the great studies and work that you guys are doing on, on, in this area and in your, in your, in your good comments this morning. But especially I'd like to congratulate Mauricio and the, and the IDB for, for taking on this challenge of, of, of really digging into the details of, of expense and costs and highlighting for, for governments the need to do that. Um, it really is an important study and, and, and an extremely important topic. Um, now, coming last, I think what I'll do is just offer some a few random thoughts and comments in, in general on the on, on the on the topic and subject. Um, starting with with a couple of, of factoids on uh, transportation costs in the U.S., where you think of the U.S. Um, infrastructure is not great, but it's better than in a lot of Latin America, and yet. Air traffic delays in the U.S. have increased 50 percent in the last 20 years, from an average of 41 minutes in 1990 to almost an hour today, which costs a, an average economic cost of $100 for every person in the United States. And you think, okay, well, we've got more and better airports than, and if you've ever been to Sao Paulo Airport or some of these places, it's, uh, the cost must be much higher, um, I would, to put it you know, mildly. Traffic congestion. The product of overtaxed highways and road infrastructure, which you think the U.S. You know, highway system is, is, is one of the best in the world, and yet overcongestion in the U.S. resulted in U.S. drivers spending 5.5 billion hours sitting in traffic last year. I don't think that even counts for me driving in this morning on 395, but if that translates into over $800 per person in lost time and wasted fuel. So the U.S. has these challenges. Latin America's challenges, I think, are even greater and, 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 and more to, to overcome. But you can see the, the costs. Um, so in terms of, of, of infrastructure development, there, there, there's, a, there's a bit of a paradigm shift, I think, in, in, uh, in the world in general. And, and part of this affects the U.S., but part of it affects Latin America as well. Um, and a couple of, of points on this paradigm shift on in, in infrastructure, first of all, is that it is more global now. And the, the infrastructure is increasingly about connectivity. It's taking into account the increased trade agreements. It's taking into account the, the opportunities to, to export. Um, it's also more global in terms of, of the engagement. You've got, com countries want the latest technology. They want to be world class in their, in their infrastructure. Um, so, it's, so it's global in technology. It's global in who does it. It's global in, in, in the purpose. And secondly, and Mauricio uh, touched on this a bit, is the, is the financing is, um, is different now. It's more of a challenge. Uh, infrastructure at one point was almost all public sector financing, some of it um, uh, the IFI financing, but um, that's become more challenging lately. The governments are, public sectors are not capable uh, in the U.S. or anywhere else, frankly, of, of, of bearing all of the costs through tax, um, taxpayer funding. And, and governments, um, laudably, are, are much more macroeconomically stable, running balanced budgets, things like that. They're, they're not going deeply into debt. Um, and this, again, puts a constraint on the availability of, of financing from the public sector. Um, at the same time, traditional bank lending is, is much reduced. Uh, European banks have pulled in their horns for obvious reasons. U.S. banks, it's, it's harder to get bank lending um, as well. So increasingly, the challenge of financing is looking for um, options that involve private sector cooperation. And, uh, and that's a challenge. It's a, it's, a, it's a challenge to get private equity in. Um, it's a challenge for governments to design um, uh, public-private partnerships or other mechanisms that hit that right balance between being attractive enough so they attract the private sector investment and protecting the public interest in, in not you know, overcharging consumers and making sure that, that you have a fair price to, uh, to governments. And this is, this is a challenge that, that governments around the world are, are struggling with. Um, and there's, there's not an easy solution to it. But it's, it's the kind of thing the IDB, I think, can offer some, some help on. And, and, uh, um, and I know is doing some good work in that area. Um, one of the um, points that, that Mauricio touched on as well is, and that's related to this, is, is, is the role of government policy and the challenges in, in, in government policies uh, being effective in developing the programs in, in, in a couple of areas. For the private sector to be interested in, in these transportation projects, first of all, many of them are long-term investments. And you're, when you build a railroad, when you build an airport, when you, uh, when you build a port, you're talking 20, 30, 40, sometimes longer. Um, and 
you need to have some confidence that, this, that, that the policy is not going to change the next time there's an election or, or, or another change of government in the country. You need to have some confidence that there's a long-term commitment to developing this infrastructure. Um, and, that's a, and that's a challenge. I mean, countries are working on it, but, but that's a challenge. Secondly, you need regulation that is, that is clear and transparent and speedy. Um, one of the challenges that, that we're seeing as, as countries um, develop uh, infrastructure projects in, from Peru to Colombia to Brazil to other places is the, the challenge of addressing the, um, the legitimate desire to ensure that you have environmental protection, that you're addressing the concerns of indigenous peoples, that you're addressing all of the all of the, the, the factors that surround an infrastructure project and make them um, sometimes controversially controversial in Latin America just as they are in, in the US. Nobody wants certain things in their own backyard. Um, but at the same time, you have a greater public good in getting these products to market and expanding the, the opportunity for, for um, areas to have access. It's a challenge for governments to, to address those sort of social demands and at the same time um, have the project go forward. And, and that has slowed down noticeably um, a number of, of projects that have been on tap in, in, throughout the region. Um, and finally, a, a, a key government role is, is, is um, in the procurement, this issue about having people that are, that are well-trained, that understand what they're, what they're doing, that have the technical capacity, that can write contracts that are clear and transparent in, in the procurement process is 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 clear and takes into account particularly particularly in these long-term infrastructure things the kind of life cycle costs and not just the the lowest upfront um, costs that you have these are these are challenges for for procurement officials um, but they they can be addressed but they but they and particularly through again help from the IDB and other global institutions um, but these these are, are somewhat limiting factors and and finally um, I'd like to congratulate the IDB on, on, on focusing on both the soft and the hard infrastructure issues. It's not just the airports and the railroads and the roads um, and the ports, it's the, it's the policies that surround them, it's the, it's the uh, customs facilitation, it's, it's the, uh, part of it is, is um, regional policies between, between governments. You know, I, uh, I lived in Uruguay for a while and, and they have a great natural port in Montevideo which is a wonderful um, sort of distribution center to, to, to go globally, and they've been growing that part. Um, but to realize its full potential, they need to use product coming down the, the, uh, the Uruguay River. And they share the Uruguay River sovereignty over that with their neighbor to the, to the west, and it's got a complicated relationship in terms of, of getting um, the permits and the permissions and the, the, just simply the, the policy issues to, especially when you, when, the, when you know, the Port of Buenos Aires thinks it's, it's competing with the Port of Montevideo for certain things. So over, and that's just one example. You have those kind of, of national sort of competitive um, or other issues, I think, in a number of countries. And again, that's a, a challenge for countries in the region to overcome. Um, and finally, I would just like to, to put in a, uh, a word for the, for the, uh, for the issue of, of transportation of um, of hydrocarbon products, um, which is an important issue as Latin America becomes a, uh, a growing power as it is in, in hydrocarbons, both, both oil and gas, transporting the hydrocarbons um, to market is a big, um, a big challenge. Transporting hydrocarbons into certain markets is also uh, a, a key challenge. And if you look at um, uh, the Caribbean islands, for example, um, where they're paying 35, 40 cents a kilowatt hour for electricity, in part because they're burning dirty diesel fuel and fuel oil. Um, there's a, a economic, um, an infrastructure and a technology challenge in finding ways to deliver uh, natural gas to those, to those islands in a efficient way that can bring down their, you know, that, that can allow them to, to move to new technologies that reduce their carbon emissions and also significantly would reduce their costs. So the transportation of fuel, I think, is, is a key part of, of transportation infrastructure that, that we shouldn't ignore. So um, with those comments, again, I just want to say congratulations and thank you for, for presenting this important study. Thank you, Dave.
Before we open it to questions, I'd like to make one comment and give Mauricio the chance to ask a question if he has one for, uh, for Barbara or David. Uh, while he's thinking of whether he wants to ask that question, I'll make one comment, uh, which is the, I make three points about what we've heard today about transport infrastructure and it's important to the trading system. First is the scale is huge. Okay, the McKinsey Global Institute looked at the amount of infrastructure investment required between now and the year 2030 globally. Just to keep up with population and economic demand, their calculation was $57 trillion with a T. That's even a lot of money for Ben Bernanke. Okay, that, that is a, the scope of the challenge is huge. Second, public budgets are inadequate. Look, we have got to find new ways of thinking and new ways of acting because, I mean, the United States uh, in the 1950s and 60s built the interstate highway system. The U.S. fiscal position is nowhere near where it was then and is in no posi would, would be in no position to replicate the interstate highway system today. That's true of a lot of budgets where there are a lot of demands, particularly when the demand for infrastructure is so large, the scope is so large. The third point I'll make is this is – this is ever more important in the world of global value chains. One of the things we were learning about global value chains, as you can see by the trade and intermediates, is to be a good exporter, you have to be a good importer. You have to be able to move goods across borders multiple times and at distances multiple times. So if infrastructure was important in the days of commodity exports to distant markets, it's even more important if you want to capitalize on capturing value in today's global value chains and the fragmentation of production, which is a point Mauricio made and uh, didn't have time to elaborate on. So uh, my, my net conclusion is this will require new thinking, new ways of thinking, new ways of acting if we're going to succeed. So with that, let me turn to Mauricio and then we'll turn to the audience. Thank you, Scott. Let me be brief. Uh, just want a quick comment. I mean, Ambassador Nelson made a reference to the U.S., and I, I think it's interesting uh, when you, you know, try to compare uh, the U.S. with the region, because uh, was, that was one of the sources of my, uh, of our inspiration with this book, because I just happened to, to read that. Uh, uh, book by Albert Fischel uh, on the railroad, railroads yeah. and the, the impact on the Midwest. You know, all that debate, you know, the, the impact of the Erie Canal and, and things like that. And, and this was the 19th century. And, and when we think about the region, I think we have yet to, you know, to have this kind of revolution happening. You know, when you think about the center, center west in Brazil, the Selva in Peru, or the Sierra, or the southeast of Colombia, you know, if you really can get those kind of projects going, you know, you, you're bound to see a lot of uh, the things you saw in the Midwest happening in the West. Of course, uh, infrastructure is, is, is not enough. You know, I'm not going to, you know, and Fischl is, is pretty clear about that. Uh, you know, it, it was one of the factors, I and mean, you need a lot of other things going on. But without infrastructure, I mean, nothing's going to happen. I mean, that's for sure. That's, a, you know, a pretty clear result we, we, we can uh, have. I mean, if you don't really improve access to those regions, there's no way you're going to take advantage of the resources they have there, and, and there's no way you're going to improve the lives of the people uh, 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 that are, are living in those areas. Uh, my question uh, uh, to, 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 I mean, and, and I also wanted to thank the very generous comments by, by Barbara and Ambassador Nelson. Nelson. Uh, uh, the book is not that good, I'm sure, you know. Uh, uh, you know uh, a lot of things we couldn't do. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, you know, methodological problems that we couldn't solve. So we would very much welcome people to, you know, uh, jump on board and criticize and, and make the same uh, moving on. Uh, uh, you know, and I think it's critical, you know, to have better policy making. We need, you know, better data, better analysis. And this is clearly, you know, lacking in the region, particularly in, in this area. And, and finally, just a question for, for uh, Ambassador Nelson and for, for Barbara. Just a, a quick uh, uh, comment about how how do you do you see I mean how do you see uh, infrastructure in Latin America? See, what would be the the main obstacles uh, 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 that need to be addressed when you think about you know Latin America in general? I mean, it would be financing, it would be you know. Uh, I don't know uh, 
something along those lines. Um, well, it's a combination of things. Uh, financing is part of it. I really think, the, however, the, the biggest challenge has to do with, uh, that, with your final point about the capacity of governments to implement uh, projects and the, um, uh, the ability, and, 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 it, and it's, it's not necessarily a reflection on, on the abilities of specific officials, it's, it's, it's challenging. I mean, there are, there are it's, it's not easy to reconcile um, the competing demands for, um, uh, for the financing, but also to reconcile the, the competing concerns and the, that, that always arise. With a big infrastructure project, you're moving earth, you're, you're displacing people, you're, you're interrupting, you know, you're, you're, you're putting somebody in a worse situation than they were before and they will protest. And, you know, in, in, the, in the view, of, you know, the, the goal is the greater good, but there's always going to be somebody who's, whose ox is gored, so to speak, and, and that's a challenge for, for democratic governments um, around the world, including in Latin America. So I think that, that that sort of the implementation piece of it is, in, in my view, the single biggest um, hurdle, although the other pieces of it, the, the technology in some cases, the, 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 the cost um, are, are, are also hurdles. No, I, I think that Ambassador Nelson hit the nail on the head. So the top of the, um, you know, the, the initial reaction would be access to financing because you do see a huge financing gap when it comes to infrastructure projects. And you see it even in projects that seem sort of on the, on the face of it to be very lucrative. And we've seen some of those in some of the large countries in Latin America recently where you think, oh, you know, this is great. They're putting out this, this big project for concession and then nobody really bids. So I think that one of the issues that, that was mentioned, the inability to write contracts in a way that satisfies both the private sector or provides incentives to the private sector and addresses public sector go or public goods um, is important. Um, and I think the inability to come up with vehicles that address these issues. And so uh, obviously moving people and moving around the environment is very, very important. But there should be ways that governments may be working with regional bodies and with each other. And the working with each other is a really big sticking point in this region um, where projects of this scope and this duration really need very often transporter cooperation, particularly if they're infrastructure projects that are geared towards integrating more with the rest of the world. We should be able to figure out how to structure vehicles such that the losers are compensated, the damage is mitigated, and you manage to come up with some sort of a compromise of you know, building infrastructure while not doing too much harm. So uh, that can be your next book. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, let me uh, let me open the floor to questions. Uh, before we start, uh, there are three uh, three rules to follow. First, uh, if you have a question, wait to be called on. Wait for the microphone. Uh, this is uh, this program is being webcast live, and the people who are watching this online won't be able to hear your question if you don't wait for the microphone. Uh, second, uh, start off by introducing yourself and identifying your organization. And the third, which I always use in a Washington audience, is what I call the Alex Trebek rule, which is make sure your question is in the form of a question. No statements, please. So with that, let me open the floor to questions. Yes, sir. Good morning. My name is Landon Loomis. I'm with the Department of Commerce. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I think it was very interesting that you talked about that a lot of the, the trade is concentrated where the costs are lowest now. So the, presumably the benefits would be from moving existing trade elsewhere or generating new trade by uh, lowering the costs outside of the traditional areas. So my question is, uh, to what extent do you think that the, the current export centers, the incumbents, would see infrastructure investments as a challenge to their, to their dominance of, of the trade routes and, and in terms of getting these projects through a political process, do you see any, any possible obstructions there? You wanna take that? Yeah, well we wanna go around. Well, we can uh, get a couple more questions while we're here and then uh, go around, so sorry for being unclear about that. There's one here and one over the, the other side. 
Um, my name is Sushil Kumar. I am uh, representing SAE Towers, which is a subsidiary of an Indian company. We have got factories in Mexico and Brazil, and we export a lot of our products in Latin America and Caribbean, as well as in America. Uh, I could not stop myself from comparing Latin America with Africa, where I have a lot of experience. And when I compare Africa, uh, I must say that Africa seems to be pretty much diversified. I mean, you look at Africa continent, out of 54 com uh, countries, nearly 30 countries speak French. and uh, so there is a clear Anglophone and the Francophone uh, countries in Africa. So, I mean, they, had the sim they have the, still have a similar problem of transportation. Uh, the cost of importing a car from Tokyo to Kenya or Nairobi is pro approximately the same if you s transship the same car from Nairobi to Senegal in Dakar in the western coast. And it, it, and this is this is exorbitant. So, but Africa has come up with a solution. I mean, they developed regional economic communities based on political uh, similarities, political affiliations. So, you have Eastern African community in East Africa. You have Southern economic uh, community in Africa. You have West African economic community in Africa. My question is that, and these African community countries, they use the same port, uh, and and there is no trade barrier. Uh, within the countries falling into the trade economic uh, community. So my question uh, to you is that, the, are there economic communities in Latin America as well, uh, which are grouped together and uh, which encourage interregional trade within the continent? Thank you. Thank you. We'll take one more question over here, and then we'll uh, come back for more. Um, hello, Matt Hallisey uh, with AECOM, and I've worked on quite a few different infrastructure projects uh, in Latin America. Um, thank you very much for the research, and uh, ju just looking at the analysis you've done, it does seem that the, the region with the biggest challenge in South America is the northwest of Brazil and everything to the east of the Andes in Peru and Colombia, and, and I guess that's hardly surprising. Your analysis seemed a little bit focused, though, on, on national access to export markets. Um, obviously, I mean, you work for IDB, and IDB was a supporter of the IRSA um, project across the Andes. To what extent do you see, um, you know, a regional integration uh, through infrastructure and reduction of tariff barriers to provide um, access to the Pacific ports for, for the Amazon region as being a key driver of, of growth there, as opposed to, um, you know, access to Atlantic ports uh, within Brazil? very much for, for the questions. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the first question about the, the sort of the political economy of that, I think there's no doubt that there's, there's uh, I think the tendency of all those uh, countries is uh, of, you know, the, the political pressure is so uh, big that uh, they end up putting more resources and trying to solve the congestions in the big cities and in, in the federal district. Mexico City and Sao Paulo and so on and so forth. So there's no doubt there is a challenge in there to try, you know, to move those resources elsewhere. Uh, and this, uh, this trade-off, you know, between addressing congestion in the center or trying to solve the problem in the more remote regions, of course, it gets worse if you don't, if you just don't give enough priority for those uh, those projects. But I, I do think there is a common interest, even in the people in Sao Paulo or Lima or somewhere else, uh, of having better access to the other regions. First of all, because there's a lot of opportunities out there. It's not just, you know, it's not just uh, regions that don't have anything that you can use. I mean, they, they have, uh, in some cases, they have a lot of uh, uh, labor. You know, when I think about the Northeast in Brazil, for instance, with all this pressure that uh, the the Sao Paulo manufacturing manufacturers are facing from China. Why they haven't moved uh, faster to the northeast, for instance, no? which labor is one third cheaper than it is Sao Paulo, uh, but they just don't do it because you know the infrastructure is terrible. There's a lot of logistic issues uh, out there. You, you can think the same thing about the south of Mexico. You know, labor is much cheaper there, but it's not just labor. You know, the center west has a huge agriculture. Uh, resources out there. So I, I don't think that those people, in entrepreneurs in those big centers, also see those opportunities there. You know, a way of taking advantage not only of the natural resources, but also a way of trying to uh, keep competing uh, uh, with, uh, uh, especially manufacturing, with uh, uh, Asia, uh, uh, you know, with China and other countries in Asia, which, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, I mean, you can't underestimate this kind of. Uh, challenge. Uh, with regard, I think that the, the question, uh, uh, the example of Africa and, and the issue that you raise about the issue, I think the, the 
questions, both questions, uh, th those, those two questions are related. Uh, and oh, clearly, I think here's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's sort of a, a, an answer to those kind of uh, uh, economies of scale and uh, economies of scope you can have around the region. Of course, you can take advantage of that, uh, of the proximity, try to concentrate uh, some of the, the flows in some of the ports, and, and try to connect better those, uh, uh, those countries. Uh, and, and the bank has been supporting IRSA uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, as much as it could. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit little bit skeptical that we would be able to move on this regional front without addressing you know the the the, the weaknesses the, the deficiencies that we had we have at the national level you know the national bureaucracies have so many problems uh, that they can even address you know the the, the national the, the local projects let alone when you get into you know a binational or a trilateral kind of projects, so uh, I think the idea is great. But I think we move perhaps too fast on, on that direction, and, and it's no surprise that uh, you know uh, we haven't moved in, in, in terms of IRSA. IRSA is this, uh, for those that don't know, is this initiative for infrastructure for regional infrastructure in South America. The idea is to uh, you know uh, have regional projects. Uh, funded by countries in the region. And, and, and so we haven't moved fast enough because we can't, we don't have the, 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 the people, no? the, 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 the bureaucracy to support those projects. Uh, and so they, they cannot even deal with the law. So if, if we don't uh, manage to strengthen these bureaucracies, this institutional framework that we have uh, at the national level, I don't think we can be ambitious enough uh, uh, to uh, think in terms of, of, of regional projects. And of course, there are opportunities there. There's a Brazil access to the, to the Pacific. And, it's, and some of it's already a reality. This uh, inter-oceanic roads that were built in, in, in Peru, in, in the south, in, in the north, uh, it clearly goes in that direction. But they, they take you to nothing in the Brazil side. I mean, this, the, the, the railroad didn't get there yet. So you need to, you know, it's, there's clearly, if the local uh, thing doesn't work, you're not going to have the, the regional side of it working. Yes, the uh, political economy uh, of the incumbents is not unique to Latin America. The uh, drama in five acts uh, at the Windsor-Detroit Bridge is an interesting case study where you have an incumbent the owner of the Ambassador Bridge and I think seven separate political jurisdictions all trying to build a bridge <laughs> between Windsor, uh, uh, Ontario and Detroit, Michigan. So it's, uh, the entertainment always continues. Yes, there was a question in the back, ma'am. Hello, yes, Sophie DeSource. Uh, thank you for your panel. Um, I'm following up uh, in the PPI question that we had earlier. Uh, did IDB by any chance try to look at creative ways, not only legally but also financially? We talked about concessions. This is more of an antiquated PPP form of model, but have um, nations within Latin America and the Caribbean started looking at uh, creative ways legally to provide for PPPs? And if so, what were the progress or the failures in this particular arena? Well, I think this is a, a, a very good question. Uh, but it's a question for our colleagues in the infrastructure department. It's not you know, something that uh, a trade economists like me, uh, I mean, I'm sure they are working on that. But I wouldn't know how to, you know, uh, give you a, a, you know, a, a good answer to that. There's a qu question here. Yes, sir. Take that one, this one, and the one across the aisle. Thank you. My name is Juan Peñerrera from the GIC Group. Uh, I want to congratulate also to the panelists and to Maurice for his excellent work. And my question is, uh, what? What are your assessment about Ecuador in, in, in the infrastructure? Uh, it has made some progress, and what is your assessment about, about Ecuador? That's my, my question mm -hmm. for trade. Thank you. Well, uh, 
I, I would love to have an assessment about Ecuador, but we couldn't just get the data uh, to, you know, uh, to include Ecuador in, in the study. Uh, well, I'll just say is that I mean, it seems to me that uh, you know it has the same kind of challenges that uh, other Indian countries have in the. The, the geography, uh, it's, it's a challenge. Uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, Ambassador mentioned uh, the, the hydrocarbon exports, which I think it's, it's a key for Ecuador. So I have no doubt that uh, it's a very strategic issue for, for the country, as it is for Peru, for Colombia. And, and uh, you know, and I would love to, at some point, have better uh, data from, from Ecuador to, to give you a more precise question, but uh, I have no doubt that uh, you know, it, it's as, it seems to be as important to Ecuador as it is to Peru or Colombia. So two, two more that we'll recognize here before we go. One right here, ma'am, yes, and then here. So wherever the microphones get. <laughs> Hello, my name is Salam Saliashvili. Um, Ms. Katra, I had a question. You mentioned that certain contracts do not receive bids. Uh, do you think it's due to the contract, contract language or due to the lack of confidence in the governments to uphold the contracts or corruption? And if, the, if it's the latter, do you think there needs to be a PR shift from the government side? Thank you. So I think that's a, that's a very good question. Um, obviously, there are many factors for why contracts might why why projects might not get bids. Um, in some cases, the language of the contract or the contract doesn't include sufficient safeguards from the government side. In some cases, the specifications aren't such. The time frame and and um, some of the the specifications for the private sector don't give enough incentives for them to be able to participate. Obviously, government stability, um, I think it was Scott who mentioned the you know, ability to know that the government that comes in next is going to be is going to carry out the same policies, and that weighs heavily on investors' decisions when we're talking about investments of 30 to 40 to 50 years. Um, you know, companies want to know that their rate of return is going to be reasonable for their investment. Corruption, countries that are more corrupt obviously require a larger rate, um, a higher rate of return in order to invest, and that has a cost for the project, and that's a very important um, element to that. So, I mean, all of the things that you point out, plus things like environmental considerations, the state of the workforce, the, you know, the existing infrastructure and how that's going to play into the contract have an impact. And so, you know, just thinking about different aspects of existing infrastructure factors, um, I think how these are structured, and I think that goes towards the creative thinking question um, that a lot of work is being done both in the private sector, I think the World Bank has some papers on this and are doing some thinking on this. Um, but so how these, how these projects are structured um, is an element and is something that you know, obviously is beyond the scope of this paper. But you bring up some, some important points that I didn't mention in my remarks. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, my name is Isabel Sepulveda. I'm with the U.S. Trade and Development Agency. Um, we've been talking today a lot about regional disparities within countries um, and the lack of institutional capacity of government officials, both in the planning, implementation, and procurement phases for infrastructure works. And so my question goes to, um, what is your view on executing infrastructure development and planning and trade integration at the state level or municipal level rather than at the national level. Uh, my agency has done a lot of work at the state level, particularly in Brazil and in Mexico, and we've seen more success just working with the governments at a lower level rather than at the federal level. And understandably, all of the pieces have to link together, but um, I'm curious if you have any thoughts on, on which level of the government you've been able to find more success with. I mean, I think there's a lot of heterogeneity across, you know, the, the, 
the levels of, levels of government across municipalities and cities. And uh, you know, if, if you go to Lima, if you go to Sao Paulo, you're going to see you know, capable uh, public officials there. Uh, not capable as we would like, but uh, you know, uh, in relative terms. But uh, if you go, you know, to the more remote areas of the country, of the countries, you know, uh, it's it's clearly a, a disaster. I mean, uh, Peru has this uh, exercise of decentralizing, you know, the infrastructure decisions, and clearly the you know the the, the municipalities uh, don't have the the, the, the capability of of designing, executing, implementing the projects. So uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's not enough to address the, 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 the problem of the central government, but it, you really ha need to go at, uh, you know, at the lowest level of government to really uh, get those uh, projects going. Unfortunately, we've run out of time before we've run out of questions, but uh, the, I think that speaks to the, the uh, quality of the presentation and the interest in the topic. I want to thank all of you for coming here today, for your interest and your support of CSIS. Please join me in thanking the, the panelists. <laughs>